Hello and welcome to Tech Deals Challenges in Upgrading Your PC Top 6 Things to Think About Before You Buy Anything to Upgrade Your System. Today I'm going to be using as a backdrop my son's $720 CyberPower PC from 2016 that we just upgraded to a Ryzen 7 3700X as a way to pick out common issues that you may find when upgrading a PC, either a custom pre-built such as this one, or perhaps one you built yourself a number of years ago and you're looking to expand or improve it in some way. I've got six different things to go through here, and while they are focused on this computer, this video is designed to be useful, helpful, and informative to anybody with any type of computer doing an upgrade to think through your purchase decisions before you rush off to Amazon or Newegg or wherever, buy some components, get them home, try to upgrade your computer, and then you have that oh no feeling as you discover that maybe a different choice would have made your life easier, as we're about to talk about in just a minute. Linked in the video description below will be two videos. The first is the full three hour live stream, uncut and unfiltered, upgrading this computer from almost its original configuration to what you see today. The second will be an edited highlights version, thanks to our editor XD for doing that, you're awesome, with just the highlights and some sped up footage to show you in a short form version what that upgrade looked like. Now today's video is not designed to show you the actual upgrade process, we'll show you a few bits of footage, but mostly focused on trials and tribulations, the challenges of doing this, and what you might want to think about before you go click checkout and buy your new parts. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of every possible problem you could run into because we'd be here for hours and that could get deeply into the weeds. Instead, it's designed to get you to think about the various issues and what might apply to your specific situation. Measuring twice and cutting once very much applies to either building or upgrading a PC to make sure that everything fits together and goes together with a minimum of fuss. The first problem we ran into was the cooler mounting hardware. Now we had an i7-7700K installed in here before with a Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo. Great cooler, had no problem cooling the 7700K without any complaints. However, my Hyper 212 Evo was purchased in 2016. Ryzen didn't exist at that point, so there's no AM4 mounting hardware in the box. New Hyper 212 Evos purchased today generally will support AM4 out of the box, so it does matter when you purchase your cooler. If I had actually been planning this out in advance making purchases, I would not have had to buy a new cooler, which is what I did in the case of this build. I used, I upgraded it to a Hyper 212 Black, but what you could do is you can request a AM4 mounting kit for your existing Hyper 212. You might have to pay like $5 shipping or something, but they'll send you an adapter kit. And if you order it at the time that you're ordering the rest of your hardware, not a big deal. You can keep using your cooler and that's a pretty good value. Otherwise, you might be sitting here trying to put it all together going, I don't have a new cooler, I don't have mounting hardware, who oh knows, what do I do? Now it is absolutely true that you could use the Wraith Prism RGB cooler that comes with a Ryzen 7 3700X, mount that on your new AM4 motherboard and not even use your Cooler Master Cooler at all. That works just fine. However, the Hyper 212 Evo, or the Black, take your pick, are quieter and frankly more effective coolers than the Wraith Prism are, even though they aren't RGB. So if you don't mind not having the RGB, if you want a silent experience, that's why there's a Hyper 212 installed in here and not the Wraith Prism RGB. Our second problem were the motherboard standoffs or mounting posts. We had an MSI B150 Bazooka Micro ATX motherboard previously installed, and when we upgraded, we went to this ASRock X470 Master SLI AC full-size ATX board. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with either micro ATX or full-size ATX, it's just different. The motherboard mounting post locations are different. And since this is a pre-built, even though it's made out of standard components, this is actually a Cooler Master Masterbox 5 case that uh, CyberPowerPC used, there were no additional mounting posts included, no pre-installed posts on the bottom ATX slots, and there was no like bag of parts that came with it the way there would be if you had just bought a case. Now this is actually a potential problem even if you completely custom build your machine. 
had you custom built this in 2016 and you don't build computers for a living the way I do, would you still have the bag of spare parts? You might or you might not. You may very well have built it and just since lost all of the spare mounting posts. And you go to upgrade it and think, no problem, I've got myself a nice fancy custom case. After, oh, where did all those parts go? And then you go to upgrade your motherboard and it doesn't fit. Now, I have multiple trays of many, many spare parts. I've obviously done a lot of cases and a lot of computers because we do tech YouTube videos. But that accumulation has allowed me to just go grab spare parts off the shelf in a way that most people honestly can't do. There was a time before I did YouTube that I didn't have as many spare parts and it certainly would have been more difficult for me as well. There are different kinds of standoffs. The threading on the standoffs is different. If you watch the full live stream, you'll actually see that I grabbed some standoffs, I tried putting them in and they didn't thread. So I had to grab some different ones before I found ones that would fit. You can buy a screw part kit that contains large numbers of uh, different types of screws, posts, etc., at different thread levels. It's just an expense you'll have to consider, but if you're making a motherboard size change or doing a lot of configuration changes to an older case that maybe you don't have all the parts for, maybe buying a screw kit off of Amazon, eBay, or Newegg, and we'll link to one down below, would make sense. The third problem is CPU support in your motherboard's BIOS. In my case, I installed a third generation Ryzen 7 3700X into a second generation X470 motherboard. It easily could have been a B450 motherboard. My motherboard did not come with a new enough BIOS to support Zen 2 CPUs. And when I first turned this computer on, it did not boot. It simply beeped, turned the fans to 100%, sat there and was like, I don't know what to do. So I had to take the cooler off, take the 3700X off, grab a trusty Ryzen 7 2700X, which is the CPUs that launch with the 400 series boards, put it together, turn it on, boot into the BIOS, run a BIOS update, which I then had to use another computer to go download from ASRock's website, update the BIOS to properly support Zen 2, shut it down, take off the cooler, put the 3700X back on, and no problem, worked perfectly, boots every time, no complaints. What if you don't have a 2700X or 1700X or whatever laying around? It's one of those things that is probably not going to be a problem for many people, but it might be. It's something you need to think about before you actually make that purchase and start to do the upgrade because without a CPU, you can be left up a creek without a paddle. My advice is if you're buying a new 3700X today, buy a 500 series board to go with it. You'll pay a little bit more, but paying a few dollars more to simply not have to worry about it at all, it removes the worry, I think is worth it personally. And especially since the new B550s are about to launch, I think that's a much better option than a 400 series board. In my case, I already had this sitting on the shelf, which is why I used it. The fourth problem is changing motherboards often changes cable locations even if the motherboard is the same size. Now, certainly if you're changing from micro ATX to full size or full size to micro, then you're definitely gonna change where the cables are and that happened in this build. But even if you change from micro ATX to micro ATX, the physical location on the board where the uh, 24 pin ATX power connector is, where the USB connectors are, where the front panel connectors are, those are in different locations on different boards. My advice is to take a look at your current motherboard and where the cables are, take a look at the potential motherboards you plan to buy, and take that into account when making a purchase. Now you might still make a purchase on a board where things are in different places, but keep in mind, you're going to need some new zip ties and do a little bit of cable management. You might have to cut the existing zip ties and reroute some cables as I did in this case. Or if you wanna make your life easy, you may wanna consider shopping for a motherboard because you can easily see the images on Amazon and Newegg. Buy a motherboard that has the connectors in basically the same spot as your current board because you can simply unplug things, take the board out, put the new board in, put the plugs right back where they were and you don't have to untie and retie everything and it will make your upgrade much easier and frankly, fuss free. The fifth problem is reinstalling Windows and saving all of your files and settings. If you are changing motherboards, you really do need to reinstall Windows. Super true if you're changing from Intel to AMD or AMD to Intel. If you don't reinstall, it's just frankly going to be a mess. So better to plan for it rather than having it turn into a headache after the fact that you weren't ready for. 
In my case, I was installing Windows to a new drive. We installed a new larger one terabyte SSD in here. So what I did is I simply disconnected all the other drives except for the M.2 drive on the motherboard. I installed Windows using a clean USB thumb drive created directly from Microsoft's media creation tool, got Windows installed, got it activated with a brand new key from URCD key, link in the video description below, just $14, that's a deal. Important to note, because if you're changing motherboards, your previous activation is probably no longer valid. This computer came with an activated copy of Windows on the MSI motherboard. However, that doesn't translate to the ASRock board, so a new copy of Windows is needed. So link down in the video description below, $14, get your copy of Windows activated. Once Windows was fully installed, activated, working, everything was great, then I was able to reconnect all of the existing drives, boot it into the BIOS to make sure that the system was booting to the M.2 drive, the new SSD that I created, Windows Boot Manager, boot into Windows, and you will see your old C drive as an additional drive. In this case, it turned into the G drive because we have so many SSDs installed. At that point, you can safely move over your old settings, your saved files, your old documents, videos, pictures, etc. And once all of that is done, then you can format your old drives because your data is safely moved over to your new one. As a side note, regarding formatting your old boot drive, of course, make sure your data is all successfully taken off before you do so. While you certainly can just format it as the new drive letter, I mentioned it was G on this machine, the old C drive, once we had reconfigured everything and set up new windows. It is worth noting that boot drives have additional hidden partitions that are created during the Windows installation process. This particular drive had four separate partitions on it, partition recovery, et cetera, the original boot partition. And just formatting it as a clean drive does not remove the old Windows boot manager and it does not remove the hidden partitions and recovery partitions. Ideally, what you would do is you would open up an elevated command prompt. CMD is the command, start, run, CMD, run as administrator. You would run a program called DiskPart, D-I-S-K-P-A-R-T. That opens up a new window with a nice screen on it, and you would type in list disk. You would look for your original C drive, you would choose select disk and type in the number, it'll be on the screen because you'll have a list of three, four, five, however many drives you have. You gotta be sure you're picking the right one here. There'll be disk labels there. It helps to label it in Windows File Explorer so you can find it in there. Select the disk, type in list partition, and it will show you all the partitions. And if it's the correct drive, you should have three or four partitions there. If you type in clean, C-L-E-A-N, with nothing else there, it will wipe every partition and turn the data into a raw drive. There is no confirmation or warning dialog box saying, are you sure? Type in clean, it does it just like that. This is not something I would advise doing without watching a how-to guide, which I'm not gonna show you here, but it is something you wanna think about. If you wanna remove the old Windows boot manager and hidden partition, that's the quickest and easiest way to do it. Once that's done, right click on the start button, choose disk manager, you'll see the drive, then you can format the whole thing with no hidden partitions and no boot recovery system from your old drive and you can make it a nice new clean data drive. A little bit more of an advanced thing there, but something to think about when setting up your new computer. The sixth problem is having the right tools. Nothing is more frustrating than trying to take something apart or put it back together without having the right tools. You might even break something in the process if you're not careful. Now, many of you have a standard number two Phillips screwdriver at home, a flathead screwdriver, and a selection of others. But do you have small miniature screwdrivers for the M.2 drives and some other components? Do you have screwdrivers with magnetic heads? That makes life so much easier when messing around with computers, having magnetic bits. Having a nice pair of cutters is very helpful for the zip ties. Having a selection of zip ties is helpful. And having a small ratchet is helpful. If you watch the whole live stream of this build, when I put the motherboard posts on, they are very, very small. You cannot grip them with your fingers. And if you take big clunky pliers, they're hard to get into the corners. This, you simply ratchet into place, no big deal. It is much, much easier. A few dollars invested in tools will make your life so much nicer whenever building or upgrading a PC.
Above all else, remember, measure twice, cut once, and remember to have fun because that's part of the reason for doing this. If everything I just described does not seem like fun, well, you might want to consider selling your old computer and buying a new CyberPower or iBuyPower PC, and then you don't have to do any of it. But if it does look like fun or you enjoy the challenge, then by all means, custom pieces are custom, build your own, and have fun doing it. If you like this video, liking, commenting, subscribing, and watching are absolutely wonderful ways to support us. Hit that bell notification icon next to the subscribe button to be sure you're actually notified when new videos come out. If you'd like to directly support the channel, hitting the join button next to the subscribe button is a great way to do it. For $2 a month, you can support the channel and get access to the private chat channels on the Tech Deals Discord linked down in the video description below. We have a wonderful community. Come by, introduce yourself, and say hello. You also get loyalty badges for comments below and during chat in our live streams indicating you are a supporter of the channel. So thank you very much for that. You can support at the $5 level if you like, and you get access to exclusive behind the scenes videos. There are now more than 60 private videos just for gold members of the Tech Deals Nation. They're also over on Floatplane if you want to support over there for the same level. And we greatly appreciate it. Your support and your just being here and watching the videos helps us keep bringing you many more to come. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you love it. Remember to subscribe to the channel with a big huge red button directly below. Questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions, you know where the comment section is. Links in the video description to a number of things I've talked about in this video. Links to a screw kit, to a zip tie kit, links to a couple of tools, and a few other things will be down there. Links to the two videos on this build, the trimmed version as well as the live stream, will all be down below. Thank you all so much for watching. We will see you next time.